Hi everybody, uh, I'm Belle Lipton and I'm the GIS librarian at the Boston Public Library. Um, and I'm gonna talk today about a project um, that we have been undertaking to increase accessibility to our Urban Atlas collection. Um, we have about 267 uh, historical atlases of Massachusetts. Um, <clears throat> these, you're probably familiar with the publishers, so you have Sanborns, Bromleys, they're, if you've worked with them, they're, they contain an, an incredibly rich amount of data. So like the Sanborns, you know, it's like one to 200 scale, you know, every plate is like one city block, and they have every, um, you know, historic uh, house number and what the buildings are made of. And similarly with the real estate atlases, um, you know, you can see cadastral property ownership information. Uh, our atlases range from like 1861 to mid 20th century. Um, and for the greater Boston area, we have not every year, but like pretty much every other. So you could, as you can imagine, these are very heavily requested. Um, so the grant that we received to, you know, increase digital access includes um, not just digitizing, but georeferencing and then stitching um, and then creating, uh, you know, map, tiled map services of these atlases that we will um, make available um, for people to bring into their own projects um, or, you know, through these um, discovery interfaces that uh, we're, we're also creating. So I just wanted to demo uh, the beta version of what we um, are working on. So you can interact with it a couple of different ways. Um, you can either find your location and you know walk around and see like oh what did this used to be where, where you're walking around and that's pretty fun like if you're sitting on the train to see like how things go around um or you can search for an address i'll do that just to kind of demo how it works um and I'll look in like south boston um so it's kind of cool you have this um if the wi-fi here cooperates you have this like spyglass viewer that is really fun to engage with and what i like about this is um not only can you uh compare sort of you know now and then you can also compare then and then so like eventually we you know we only have like 20 atlases right now loaded in because we're still you know creating this data um but anything that we have in here um you can uh it's, it's a really amazing way to kind of see how the city has like changed and developed over time. Um, so um, basically my talk today is mostly gonna uh, focus on how to get, if, if you are a collections that has, um, you know, these types of resources, like how do you get them into these formats that can then be like integrated into your own project? Um, so. We use mostly all free tools. Um, so we uh, do most of our raster processing in QGIS and using like some Python scripts with like the Osteo, like Google toolkit. Um, the app that we just looked at was done in open layers, but we also have some um, more simple like finding aid type um, apps that are, are like web pages done in like leaflet. I also want to point out this docs guide that we have. So um, this entire process, start to finish, of like starting with like scanned maps all the way to um, publishing the tiles, um, is explained like step by step in these like really elaborate guides that we wanted to make public public so that like all the sort of headaches that we've come across, like you won't have to if you want to do this, you won't have to like repeat our errors. Um, oh, and I also wanted to point out that this is really easily achievable, it, like in something like ArcGIS. Um, the, if you happen to have like access to, um, you know, like a license through your university or especially like a server, it is really easy to create raster mosaics and then like push them to the server. The reason that we are doing it open source is because we're kind of like thinking about, um, you know, sort of on the terms of like how libraries want to preserve things so like hundreds of years so like we it, it really matters to us that like the data that we're outputting is like in as open formats as possible but um if that's like not that big of a concern to you um like sort of working around the different you know not using esri has been a little bit more challenging so if you want to just do like a more straightforward process like i also have um not public facing documentation but like internal guides for how to do that so you can just email me and i'll share those with you um, so I'm not going to talk too much about georeferencing, but I did want to just point out that if you are doing this, make sure that you're backing up control points because <laughs> that's um, something that, like, you know, a little hiccup where that we run into where if, like, you know, you have students doing it, making sure that you're, like, checking that they're doing it really. Um, because, like, if you are, um, you know, say you export a geotiff with, like, the wrong settings or the wrong spatial alignment, you know, it's a matter of having to do it all over again versus just, like, really easily re-importing the points, um, which look like that. 
Another note, um, the atlases, the data that we're working with, the atlas plates, they are very nuanced. They are not standardized whatsoever. Um, but if you're working with maps that are standardized, like have really, you know, more like rectangular boundaries, I would definitely check out, um, I have a citation to this paper from the National Library of Scotland at the end of my, on my last slide. Um, and I think they do like 2,000 maps a day, like, or something like that. So if you have, um, like more standard data, definitely check this out. Um, the process that's described in our guides is all manual georeferencing and, and mosaicing. So, um, one other point is that um, in addition to like mosaicing them, we're also uploading the individual georeference plates to our digital collections as like counter counterparts to like the regular library items. So that's just another way that we're increasing accessibility. Um, so once we georeference them, the next step is to create the mosaic. And essentially, like what the process for this in a nutshell is like, we're making this um, polygon like vector layer where um, there's a feature that cor a, like a polygon feature that corresponds with every input plate um, that serves as like the masking feature for that plate. So you sort of mask. You use this layer to mask all of the individual plates, and then once they're masked like mosaic them together. Um, and then we create like a tile cache based on that and like plop it on like cloud storage. So that's sort of like in a nutshell what the process is. Um, we, <laughs> this is like what happens if you don't create that masking layer. <laughs> um, so there's all sorts of like, like if you were to just try to smush all these plates together, there's like these artificial um, black boundaries that, you know, are from the alignment, but then also so that's what the masking layer looks like. Also, there's like these natural uh, empty spaces on the plates themselves. Um, so that's like before masking, after masking. So you can see like in order to create this like seamless fabric, you really want to like, um, and we, we do hand draw them, like hand draw, you know. We, ma we make these like very nuanced like custom um, masking features because we want to have like a really useful result in the end. And I've just included some examples of like cases where you would need like a human being to determine like what you want to show through so that it's like of the utmost uh, value to researchers. So like there are so basically on almost every plate like adjacent sheets will represent the same area and it's not just that there's no data versus some data like some will have data and some some will have just better data so it kind of like requires a human being to like make those choices um, and so yeah it takes a really long time but it's worth it because it makes these amazing mosaics that people uh, love to use um, so I've just thrown up some of like the typical commands that we use for processing um, it's pretty straightforward like we use Google warp for handling projections and we use Google translate for like making sure that all of our image properties are consistent when we're feeding them into the mosaicing tool. Um, the, the tool that actually does the mosaicing is this build, build vert or build virtual raster. So um, the script also is included in that um, documentation guide. Um, and so there's one last thing that we do before we just kind of like send these out into the public, these mosaics. Um, we really, like while it's really amazing to be able to like interact with this seamless fabric, like, you know, all is one, we definitely want to still have a way to know like what library item you're engaging with in any, at any given time. So what we do is we, um, we use that same um, like masking layer, which already is like a geographic representation of every plate, and we join it with um, like, bi like straightforward bibliographic library metadata. Um, so this is kind of like a fake layer that sits on top of our imagery so that you're able to like differentiate between any of the given plates. Um, which can be helpful. So like that's, you know, it is nice to be able to explore it in the app that way, but there's like a ton of cases where, oops, you would want to still know like what map you're working with. So I have a couple examples of some of the like challenges um, of this. So um, like these, I don't know if, it, has anyone ever encountered like the paste-ons in the sandboards? <laughs> um, yeah, so they're like notorious for, like once you start getting into the 20th century, like they're not making a new <laughs> book every year. They're literally just like with glue, like pasting on like development changes. Um, and so people are always like delighted by looking at these, but they're um, <laughs> like, it's not very consistent. So like if I, you know, if like BPL has one volume, like Harvard Maps might have another same, same thing, but it's like you can't be sure that the um, they have all the like paste-ons or maybe they lost it or whatever. So this is one example of like one, how do you represent this digitally, and two, um, like if you're doing serious research, you probably do still want to like come into the library. Um, here, this one cracks me up too. So this is. 
These are two adjacent plates like georeference in the same volume from the same year and it's the same property but they have two different owners. <laughs> so like there's really not that much that we can do with this when we're mosaicing. Like we have to choose which one we want to, um, to represent. Um, and so again like you're still going to want to come in. So this is again so it's a challenge of the project but also like a case where like having that vector layer that's going to tell you oh this is the exact like plate that you're working with would be really helpful. Also extremely helpful for librarians. So like if we have someone that's like, I want to look at my grandma's house from every year from like 1860 to 1950, like these are, we have all these gigantic books. So like being able to know exactly what page it is and even maybe having them use the app is really helpful. Um, a quick note on what we're using for tiling. Uh, we also use Google to tiles. Um, just because it's cheap and also like it doesn't require any sort of um, like special map server configuration. Like you can just make them and then we just put them on our cloud storage. Um, we use this like local um, it's a company called Wasabi. I think we just got a bill for like six dollars in the mail for everything. It's like really not that expensive. The storage and then the like labor, the staff labor is like the only costs in this project. Um, but if you want to use something that has like a GUI. ArcGIS Pro, again, pretty easy, and um, like there's other ones like MapTiler um, that are paid. I also wanted to really quickly demo, um, like we wanted to make it really, really easy for people to grab these links. So you know, any oops, <clears throat> any map, um, you can just go in and copy this link. And so we're really seeing this as like the basis for other research. So um, if you want to look at like if you want to do a spatial analysis of like the denominations of churches in Boston or something like that, the first step doesn't have to be like, oh, I need to geo-reference and stitch together all these maps. Like these already all exist. You can just grab the link and bring them into whatever project. Um, so yeah, that's pretty much it. My in conclusion, this like really increases accessibility. Um, it's achievable in lots of different ways, paid and free. And if you're going to make something like fun and snazzy, you just want to make sure that it, like points back to the traditional library ways to discover things. Thank you.